Welcome to the KWB webinar, Recessions, A Survivor's Guide. My name is Robert Bullock and I'm one of the wealth managers at KWB. I'm based out of the Monrovia, California branch office. Before we start, I've got uh, two housekeeping items I wanted to run by. First, we're gonna be taping and recording today's event, which will be available for viewing on the kwb.com website as soon as possible. Second, questions that were submitted when the attendees signed up for this event are going to be answered by the speakers when they present their part of the uh, presentation. If you'd like to send an email to us during the presentation, you can send it to invest at kwbwealth.com and I'll have a wealth manager follow up with you uh, after this presentation. So we have two experienced speakers today, Diana Saylor and Michael Razouk, who are wealth managers with KWB Wealth, and they're based out of the Redlands corporate office. So let's go ahead and get started. We are in very interesting times that require timely information. So Diana, why don't you give us your thoughts and maybe some actionable ideas? Thank you, Robert. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We want to start out by providing you with the actual definition of what a recession is. You know, I think there's the technical definition, but there's also the individual interpretation of what a recession is. You know, I remember back to 2008, that recession actually ended in June of 2009, but the effects of that recession lasted for years. And it seems as though people felt like we were still in the recession years later. The former definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of shrinking GDP. But now the National Bureau of Economic Research, they define it as a significant decline in economic activity spread across the economy lasting more than a few months, normally visible in real GDP, real income, employment, industrial production, and wholesale retail sales. So we just ended the longest bull market in history, and we may now be in the shortest bear market in history. And some think that we may already be out of this recession. Mike, can you elaborate on some of the bear market re recoveries that we've seen in the past? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the first things to kind of keep in mind is almost all recessions have been accompanied by a bear market. You know, a bear market is essentially when the stock market declines 19% or more. But it's also to, important to keep in mind that not all bear markets happen during a recession. Um, but why we're watchful for them, you know, as, a, as advisors, as investors, is the most severe bear markets do occur during a, a recession. And so when we look at the historic averages, you know, during a recession, a bear market tends to last 18 months. So it's a long, slow, arduous process. The market tends to go down 37% on average, pretty severe. And then it's almost a 30 month recovery. So they're very long drawn out during a recession. But when we have a bear market, you know, think uh, 2018, December 2018, where we had a 19% a or greater pullback, it, it lasted pretty quick. So on average, it's about seven months, 24% decline in the market, and about 10 month recovery. So we're always trying to watch, when do we think that the economy's in a recession? Because that's an economic indicator. And when is that gonna occur? Because that bear market, a market indicator, is usually gonna be much severe, much longer lasting. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see when they call this one. So now we're gonna move on to strategies that we encourage you to implement to help you get through the current downturn and prepare for the next. First off, it's important to get your financial house in order. So first thing you should do is identify your income sources and sustainability. So were you affected by the pandemic? What is your household income situation like? Is it the same? Were you essential workers and maybe everything is status quo? or maybe you know, one or both of you or whoever's in your household has lost your job, you know, and maybe expenses need to be cut. 
So once you've identified, you know, where your employment situation is or what the income situation is in your household, the second step would be to create a budget. And so find an effective application, find some software. Um, you know, if you don't want to utilize what we would suggest, we suggest using Simplify by Quicken and we actually use it. The other thing I wanted to mention is any of the resources that we provide to you during this presentation, we actually use it ourselves. You know, how many times have you gone to a seminar and, and you're really motivated and they give you good material, but you go home and well, where do I start? So that's what we wanted to provide for you is the resources that you can utilize to achieve these goals. So Simplify is really nice. It's about 35 bucks a year. You, um, you add your bank account to it if you feel comfortable doing that. And it just allows you to identify your income coming in and your expenses. And so once that happens, once you do the budget, which I think everybody should have a budget, whether, whether or not you lost your, your employment or you're retired or whatever, you should have a budget. And then next you wanna identify your goals or obligations. Do you have something that you need to do this year, pay for that isn't day to day? You know, identify those things. Then what you wanna do is you want to differentiate your expenses as far as essential expenses and non-essential expenses. So essential expenses, meaning your needs, non-essential, meaning your wants. So let's show you an example. So maybe your essential expenses needs mortgage, utilities, loan payments, food, health, healthcare, whatever you need for health. Maybe it's $3,700 a month. And then your non-essential expenses, maybe those are items like uh, books or entertainment or subscriptions or whatever those may be. And maybe that is around, you know, 1100 a month or so. And so the importance of this is that when you identify the essential versus the non-essential, the reason why that's important is that if you need to cut expenses, well, now you know where to trim the fat, right? If you just kind of look at your bank account and you're like, I don't know what's going on. You know, how do you know where you need to cut? So this is an important, important exercise, especially if you have a life changing event. Then there's another category, which I like to call non-negotiables. So non-negotiables are basically things that you spend your money on that are important, but maybe not essential. So for example, like for myself, it's massages or yoga or Pilates or anything that keeps me mentally and physically fit. You know, Mike likes the mountain bike. You know, these are things that you want to build into your budget. Of course, you can cut these things if you need to, but, you know, we call them non-negotiables. So once you identify those things and create a budget, then there should be some top goals as far as budgeting goes. So step one. You know, we have said time and time again, if you're a client, you have heard this over and over again, you know, have three to six months of cash savings. Okay. But we're going to take it one step further. What I mean by that is if you do the example of identifying what your essential expenses are, times that by three to six. Okay. We actually encourage you to try to shoot for six because then that just provides you with much more cushion to deal with things that, that you have to deal with. You know, if you had six months of savings and the pandemic happened and maybe you were furloughed or whatever, that would have given you, you know, a huge cushion. You know, maybe if unemployment wouldn't cut it or whatever the case may be. The other thing is that if, you know, you find yourself not really having a cash cushion and maybe you're struggling right now, there is um, the CARES Act, which was enacted this year um, due to the pandemic. And so what it allows you to do is if you have retirement savings, it allows you to access up to $100,000 and you can spread that tax liability over three tax years. And if you're under 59 and a half, there's no penalty. So of course we would incur, that's like last case um, or you know, worst case that you should access those funds, but at least it's there for you if you should need it. So step one, make sure you have cash savings. Step two, pay down your debt if you can. Um, so highest interest, highest balance, try to pay down your debt as much as you can. Consolidate if necessary. Step three, continue to fund your retirement plan. You know, sometimes we get calls and people are scared and should I stop deferring to my 401k? No, 
absolutely not. You know, you should continue funding at least 10%. Try to do 20 if you can. I know it's it's hard. You know, if you get a pay raise, add a little bit more to the retirement accounts. But you know, for right now, try to do all of these things. Um, and you know, if you have a cash savings, that would also help you not have to lower your deferrals or stop your deferrals to your retirement plan. And you know, these deferrals act like it's an essential expense. So when you're building your budget, that needs to be over on the essential expense um, item list. So those are the top three priorities. So now that we've touched on the top priorities, you know, there are some things that you can do in the current low interest rate environment. So first off, it's pretty popular. A lot of people are refinancing right now. So you should consider, but you should, you know, go over the numbers. You know, we like to use different websites to look at rates or shop rates. You should always shop rates. Don't just go with the first email or phone call or whatever you get. Uh, so we use two different websites. We use bankrate.com and we also use smartasset.com. And we use that to shop rates. But the other thing that you should pay attention to is, or consider is what kind of refinance do I need? What's the purpose of why I'm doing the refinance? Is it just to get a lower interest rate? That's what we call a conventional refinance. If you want to pull out cash to pay off debt or remodel your house or whatever the case is, uh, cash out refinance, the rates tend to be a little bit higher there. There are some things you should consider, you know, closing costs, look at the actual APR, do you have at least 20% equity in your home? Uh, otherwise, you'll pay mortgage insurance. So there are a variety of things that you should pay attention to when considering a refinance. And then the next thing, um, you know, as far as refinancing, you know, I really like to utilize this tool. It's Dave Ramsey's Mortgage Payoff Calculator. It's a website. So if you just Google that, it'll pull up the website. It's very, very powerful. So what you can do is put in your current loan parameters and it'll tell you what amount of interest that you will pay over the life of that loan. And then you can go in and edit it to put in the lower interest rate and maybe you're changing the duration of the loan. It'll show you what the interest is for that loan. And then you can kind of compare and contrast. And then also too, maybe you decide, you know what, I'm gonna do a 30 year because I don't wanna be obligated to a higher payment, but I'm gonna send extra because I wanna pay it off in 20 years. It'll tell you exactly what you need to send and when. So it's a very powerful tool. The next thing that we would suggest that you possibly uh, capitalize on or, or do is basically, you know, look at your credit card situation. Do you have a credit card situation? Um, consolidate if you can. There are a lot of really great 0% offers out there right now. So 20, 21, 24 months of 0%, it's a, it's a great thing to take advantage of. But there's some things to think about here. When you do a balance transfer for with a credit card, sometimes they charge three to 5% transfer fee. But what I have heard sometimes is people will open up a 0% transfer it over and then do it again when that offer has expired. That should not be your goal. Your goal would be, I'm going to do this one time thing. I'm going to consolidate it all, pay it off and just be done. And also, this is a good time to analyze your behavior. Are you the type that, you know, you have a credit card, you charge everything, you pay it off at the end of, of the month. Perfect. Then credit card are for you. If you continue to have a balance on your cards, you know what, just pay it off, cut them up, or put them in the safe, or whatever, and just um, analyze what you're really doing with those cards. We like to use nerdwallet.com, so it's a really, really neat website. It's user-friendly, and so when you log on, it asks you, you know, what's your, what are you looking for? Are you looking to consolidate, zero percent, do you have a card that maybe isn't very good with points or miles or whatever? Nerd Wallet is, um, is, is a pretty good resource. The next thing that you could do to capitalize on the low interest rate environment, maybe you have a student loan. So some people may be waiting around to see if student loans are going to be forgiven. I don't know that I would bank on that, but maybe you want to wait till next year. I'm not sure. But um, you might want to consider refinancing your student loans. I've seen rates as low as maybe two and a half, three percent. So that is another thing that maybe you could utilize. The last thing would be consider maybe financing a car purchase, whether it's a new or used car. So maybe you're the type where you really do not like car payments. So you use your cash 
or um, maybe you liquidate an after-tax investment account to purchase the car. So I would argue that uh, a lot of these lenders and car dealerships, they're offering 0% for at a minimum. I've seen 60 months and as long as 72 months. So why not utilize that? Don't liquidate your investments, which may be at depressed prices, um, and don't you know, realize the capital gains. Um, I would just consider maybe financing at this point. And so now that we've talked about things that you can do to help get your financial house in order, let's talk about some investment strategies that you should take advantage of. Mike? Yeah, thank you, Diana. You, you said some things that really resonate with, with me, you know, making sure that you try to get that emergency fund so that you can continue funding retirement accounts through a recession. And uh, lots of times we can look at a recession as it's an opportunity or we can become a victim of it. And we wanna share some tips for us to become opportunists. And so one of the most important things to try to do is keep making retirement plan contributions and investments during a recession. And uh, lots of times, you know, when you're looking at making a purchase, if, if you wait for a sale, you're more likely to, to get excited about something and to, to wanna make a, a purchase, you know, think about a TV if, if you're, uh, wanting to buy it and all of a sudden it goes on sale 25 or 30 percent, you get excited if, if you're in the market for that. And uh, what tends to happen is for some reason, stocks seem like the one thing that people try to run away from when they're on sale. And so we want to, you know, give you guys some encouragement and just help reframe the way that we think about markets and, and stocks as, as an asset class. And so <clears throat> one of the important strategies to take advantage of is what we call dollar cost averaging. So lots of times if we see a pullback in the market, people might get excited. They might want to buy some stocks on sale. And let's say you put in $12,000. Well, you're buying on that day at that price and it could be a good price. It could continue to go down a little bit more. With dollar cost averaging, what you're doing is you're buying in increments, a systematic process. And the nice thing is when you're making a, a 401k or a retirement plan contribution, you're doing this automatically. Every time you get paid, you're making a purchase. And so this is something that gets implemented automatically when you're continuing to fund a retirement plan. So please do that. And what tends to happen is if the market continues to go down, you know, you're buying more shares at an average cheaper price. That's the concept of dollar cost averaging. So don't stop those contributions. And the reason why you want that emergency fund before the recession is so that you have the confidence to keep contributing through a recession. You don't feel like, hey, my cash flow could be at risk. I need to stop these contributions. Continue to make them, take advantage of dollar cost averaging and implement that, that pretty simple strategy. The next strategy that I wanna mention is one that you've probably heard before, but few tend to implement it and we call it rebalancing. So what tends to happen is when you're creating a portfolio initially, you're looking at what kind of risk am I comfortable taking? How much stock exposure is appropriate for me? And if you don't know, this is something that we're glad to help you with. We have great tools to do this. And so let's say that you take a test and you find, hey, 65% stock is appropriate for me. You create that portfolio. Well, if we're in a bull market and stocks are doing well, they're gonna become a disproportionately larger piece of your portfolio over time. If they're growing faster, you're gonna have less in bonds overall as the market continues to grow higher. So the important thing to do is sell some of those stocks high before a recession. Rebalance your portfolio back to that appropriate risk portfolio that you determined when you initially started investing. And this is the one that people tend to do even less is rebalance during a recession. Because what's gonna happen, we mentioned that on average, you know, the market might have a 35, 37% pullback. That means your stocks are, are gonna become a smaller portion of your portfolio. So rebalance, and what tends to happen when you do that is now you're buying stocks low. So when you rebalance before a, a recession, you're selling high. When you're rebalancing during a recession, you're buying stocks low. We've heard that before several times, but this is something that few people tend to implement in their strategy in their portfolios. And as far as frequency, when should you be doing this? Annually has been proven to be the most effective frequency. So you could do it quarterly, you could do it annually. What tends to happen is most people just don't do it. So find a frequency and stick to it. But annually seems to be the, the most effective way to rebalance a portfolio. Lots of 401ks give you the option to do that automatically. 
So take advantage of that, have a systematic process, and just stick to that. Uh, the next thing that we want to touch on is market timing. So this is something that tends to happen quite a bit. I know, Diana, I've got into the conversation with lots of clients. Should we sell? You know, the market's going down. Should we try to jump out and, and uh, you know, don't want to catch a falling knife here? Stop the bleeding. All things that we hear quite often. And in theory, it, it would be great if we knew where the top of the market was, where the bottom of the market is. But because we don't, you know, one of the most important things to do is just stick with your strategy. So what we tend to find is some of the best days in the market are following some of the worst that we saw. And so lots of times somebody's going to want to jump out of the market after they feel terrible. You know, they have that gut-wrenching statement, they have that gut-wrenching experience by watching the news, and they just want out. And when we look back at uh, what happened in February and March, you know, we saw some almost 10% positive days, 6%, 5%. And if people are out, they, they sold, they're missing that chance for their portfolio to recover. What's interesting is when we look back over the last 25 years, if you were sticking to an investment strategy, you were invested in the S&P 500, your average return was about 9%. If you missed the 10 best days though, that dropped down to about 5.62. If you missed the 20 best days, just out of a 25 year period, your, your average return was 3.42% over that 25 year period. So, you know, the reality is we don't know what the market's gonna do day to day. Stick with your strategy, stick through it, and don't try to time it. I know it feels like the right answer to try to take control, you know, to be in charge of a situation, but with investments, we, we need to stick to our long-term plan and focus really on what is right for us. And, and so on my next topic, I wanna to talk about, well, what is the right mentality to have? you know, for stocks, how do we stick to our plan? Because this is, you know, where, where lots of people get disconnected. So maybe let's think about stocks as a different asset altogether. Let's say that you have a plan, you bought a, a investment property, and you plan on selling it in 10 years. Well, if you have a plan, it's, it's easy to stick to it. And if you look at the asset that you have, you're buying it for a reason right? You think, hey, over the next 10 years, I'm going to get rent, I'm going to get income from this asset, and I might have some price appreciation. So if somebody was knocking on your door every single day, hey, you know that rental property that you just bought? It's worth $30,000 less. It's worth $20,000 less. You're not going to panic if you're sticking to your plan. So focus on the asset that you have, focus on your plan, and don't get caught up on the price. Because what happens is the price is going to matter on two days, the day that you bought it and the day that you're going to sell it. In between, collect your rent. And what happens with a stock portfolio, on the next chart, I'm going to show you something extremely interesting. You're getting rent by owning stocks in the form of dividends. And right now, that dividend yield is about 2.33%. Compare that to the 10-year treasury at the moment, which is paying 0.63. So in other words, you're getting a higher rent, keeping your stock portfolio, and if you held that stock portfolio for the next 10 years and you had no price appreciation, you were still better off holding that stock portfolio. So again, focus on the asset that you have. Focus on the income that it can generate for you and focus on your plan. Don't look at the price day to day. That's what's going to make us make a bad decision, try to time the market and, you know, potentially miss out on, on good long-term gains. And so what we find is, yeah, the market over a long period of time, it does well. You know, this is showing us the last 35 years, the average return was 14.4% in the S&P 500. But during the course of the year, the average pullback we saw was about 10% during the course of a year. So in other words, the market doesn't just go straight up. It doesn't just do the averages. There's years where the market does phenomenal, 2013, 2017, 2019. There's years where it does bad this year, 2018, 2008. And the averages factor all of that in. So look at the long-term growth potential that you're hoping for, stick to your plan, and realize you have a good asset. You're investing in companies that you believe in, and you have a strategy to take advantage long-term of the returns that are potential with the markets. Absolutely. And, you know, having the right mentality about stocks during recession, it's crucial. But I think the same also goes for the upcoming election. We'll get into that in just a second. 
but uh, we want to first start off by going over what's the current state of the economy. So first off, like I said earlier, some may think that the recession may likely be over. So we'll wait to get the official call, but it, there may be a good chance that we're already out of this. The other thing is third quarter GDP numbers will be coming out soon. And some say likely should be up about 20%, maybe even 30%. And the reasoning for that would be an increase in consumer spending. There's also an increase in consumer confidence. So things are moving in the right direction on that front. So it'll be interesting to see what the numbers are. As far as the stimulus package, uh, according to the news today, it looks like they're really making some strides on that and maybe we'll have a package here soon. Unemployment, uh, so we're about 8.4%. It was as high as 14.7. So we've made huge improvement there. And then COVID-19 cases, so we are trending downward. That's a good thing in the US at least. Unfortunately, uh, abroad cases are increasing. And uh, last night uh, during the debate, there was hints of maybe having a vaccine by next August, maybe November, but you know, it's, it's on its way and they're fast tracking it. So um, as long as we stay uh, or continue on the right direction, hopefully we'll see improvements and some states will begin to reopen and, and we can get back to work. Um, so we're just gonna have to take it week by week. Uh, so I'm sure most of you saw the first debate last night. Um, interesting. Uh, we just wanted to give you an, an overview of, of maybe what to expect on either, with either party. You know, last night's debate, we really didn't learn anything new except for maybe the importance of an uninter uninterrupted two minutes. But, um, <laughs> you know, as far as taxes, so we know first thing taxes. Under Biden, probably going to go up. It does depend on Congress, but most likely going to go up under Trump, probably going to stay the same. Regulation, Biden is probably going to increase regulation and Trump will continue deregulation. Infrastructure spending, both have indicated that they are interested in, in that as a priority. COVID-19 stimulus, both have, have talked about uh, continued stimulus. Biden most likely would maybe change immigration and trade policies and Trump would most likely continue on his efforts against China and possibly EU tariffs. And then energy. So under Biden, most likely spending um, towards alternative energy and then Trump would continue on the energy independence initiative. So just some high level things, you know, maybe with the, the next debate or the third debate, maybe we'll learn a little bit more about what their goals are uh, or priorities. But those, those are just some high level things. Um, and there are some interesting statistics that indicate that the stock market might be an accurate predictor of the election results. Mike, what have we seen in past elections? Yeah, good point. Uh, it seems like we always try to draw associations, you know, did uh, the groundhog see his shadow? Does that mean that we're going to have a Republican or a Democrat victory? Um, the market does tend to be a pretty good indicator of whether the incumbent wins or potentially loses. And so what we tend to find is the four months leading up to the election are very crucial. And if the market's up 4% or greater, usually the incumbent tends to win. If the market's up, but less than 4% or it's negative, sometimes the incumbent loses. So it's, it is a good indicator, but there's also another one that's also important. And that's if we've had a recession in the last two years of a presidential cycle. So with Trump at the moment, the market has been pretty good. We've had a, a strong recovery. We actually reached new highs. And at some point the market was, you know, over that 4% mark, it's come back down a little bit, but there's still quite a bit of time between now and November 3rd. Uh, but we did have a recession during this last year of uh, President Trump's uh, cycle. So, you know, now we have two conflicting statistics that are potentially butting heads. So yes, the market is a pretty good indicator. And the key thing to remember is, you know, if it's up 4% prior to the election, there statistically has been a very strong chance of the incumbent keeping office. Um, Lots of times what, what tends to happen is people ask us, you know, if this candidate or that candidate wins, should we change our investment strategy? And I think a lot gets lost on what happens with Congress as well. 
you know, it's very important to look at the presidential election, but also what's going to happen in the House and the Senate. And uh, what we tend to find is the best market environment occurs during gridlock. You know, companies feel like we're not going to get any big policy changes because they probably won't agree on anything. And so we like to see it when, you know, one party controls the House, one controls the Senate. That's usually when the market tends to do the best. But, you know, the chart up there is showing that usually the market does well, regardless of who holds office, who owns the Senate, who has the, the House of Representatives. And so we, we get so focused on, is the market going to tank? Is it going to cra crash? Should we change our investment strategy based on who gets elected? And the reality is markets go up under Democrats. They go up under Republicans. They go up under split Congresses, under, you know, fully controlled Houses and Senates. And so we don't encourage people to be changing their investment strategy because, you know, X candidate is going to get elected. Um, it's important to see. It's important to look at the policies and make good decisions. But we don't recommend changing investment strategies because of that. And final thought here, you know, the, the concern often arises when we have a new high. We had a new high at the beginning of, of September, and we had a lot of underlying issues with the economy still. And what we tend to find is, Usually 12 months after a new high, market on average is another 8.3% higher. So I remember getting a text from my father-in-law when the market hit uh, 20,000 on the Dow. Hey, what next, Mike? And I responded back 21. You know, it's always going to go higher over time because the economy is growing. We're buying something that we believe in, an asset. We're buying companies that want to be profitable, that want to continue to grow and innovate, whether Trump or Biden becomes the next president. So focus again on what we own, on the asset that you have, and not on the price of it. So yeah, we think the market may be headed higher, even though we reached new highs. Thanks, Mike. So yeah, there's, to sum all this up, there's a lot of things to worry about, be concerned about. But, you know, my husband always tells me, you know, only worry about the things that you can control. So what can you control? Your own situation. So how do you do that? You create and maintain a financial plan. So what is a financial plan? We like to call our plans uh, live well plans. And so what do they do? So first off, they all of the principles that we discussed earlier, it ties everything all together. It gives you the confidence in your financial decisions. It also, it's a roadmap to your goals. You, could, you get to see everything spelled out. It shows the effect of a bear market. And then also it helps you identify the effective solutions. So what we wanted to do is we actually have a real, well, not a real example, but we have an example of our Live Well plan and how a recession, how might that affect your retirement goals? Mike? Yeah, thanks. So, you know, I put a pretty simple case together and we just said if somebody had a million dollar portfolio a, a couple had a million dollar portfolio and they uh enter retirement you know what could happen is at end of life at age 90 they could be passing on seven hundred thousand dollars but if they experience a 35 percent decline they have a recession you know what potentially could happen is uh oh they're running out of money at 85 82 well we don't want that we don't want them living on cat food for the last eight years of their life and so what a financial plan does is it helps us identify what's the potential trajectory of somebody's money and what are some of the solutions that we could do to get the plan back on track. So maybe we make a suggestion to collect social security a little bit later. Well, that looks like it almost made something worse. So we wouldn't want to do that. Maybe it's increased their stock exposure, you know, try to buy low and take advantage of the market recovering. And that seems like it made up some pretty good ground. Another thing that we could do is potentially lower expenses. So this couple wanted $5,500 a month. Maybe now they're gonna get 5,000. Well, that almost got them to their goals. And so if we combine a couple strategies, we can get people back on track. And now maybe instead of passing on you know, 600,000, they're passing on 400, but at least their goals were met, their financial plan was carried through fruition. And so we use a financial plan as a tool to be able to identify icebergs before we hit them you know, years away, hopefully, and figure out the most effective way to get a plan back on track. 
so we're able to you know maintain the retirement that that hopefully our, our clients want that's great you know these live well plans are so empowering and it's just very interesting to see each case every single person is different so if you haven't done a live well plan or you want us to help you please let us know and that's all we have for you today thank you so much for joining us in about a half hour or so you should be receiving an email with a link to a survey of ours we would love feedback we'd like to hear what you thought about today's presentation on the survey you can select whether you would like an initial consultation and or a live well plan created for you and then also, you know, the resources that we mentioned during the presentation, the websites and whatnot, we will, if you fill out the survey, we will send an email with those resources for you to take advantage of. And with that, we thank you very much and hope you have a wonderful day.